Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? My guest today is David Kilcullen, a theorist and practitioner of guerrilla and unconventional warfare and counterterrorism with extensive operational experience over a 25-year career with the Australian and U.S. governments as an army officer, analyst, policy advisor, and diplomat. He served in Iraq as senior counterinsurgency advisor to U.S. General David Petraeus, was senior advisor to U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, and has served in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, Libya, and Colombia. He's professor of international and political studies at the University of New South Wales, Canberra, and he's the author of five prize-winning books on terrorism, insurgency, and future warfare, including his latest, The Dragons and the Snakes, How the Rest Learned to Fight the West. I know that I've said this a number of times about prior conversations with other guests, but I have to say it again because this really was one of the best episodes that I have ever done. It deals mainly with the evolution of warfare and the threat environment that we currently face, including an extensive analysis of Chinese and Russian conventional and unconventional methods of warfare that target the West, but we also couldn't ignore what's been happening in the world and in the U.S. with the spread of the coronavirus, what's now been officially declared to be a global pandemic by the World Health Organization, and the emergency measures that are being put into place as we speak, both at a national and state level, both here in the United States, but also across every major developed and developing economy hit by this growing epidemic. The conversation speaks for itself, and in fact, we dove right into our discussion without the usual introduction, so the first 50 seconds or so is going to sound a little distorted because David hadn't started recording his end of the conversation yet, but like I said, that only lasts for less than a minute, so you don't have to worry about it for the rest of the episode. I hope you're all managing this turbulent and stressful time as best as possible. I think we're all doing our best, and I can promise you that I'm going to be doing my very best to continue to bring you the most insightful, educational, and relevant conversations I can on the things that matter most to all of us while we try and navigate this difficult but also opportunity-filled time together. And with that, please enjoy this timely thought-provoking, and deeply informative conversation with my guest, Dr. David Kilcullen. For someone like you, I imagine this is like par for the course, right? Well, I mean, I think this is a slightly unusual set of circumstances, given how rapidly it's spread. It's You could almost say it's gone viral, right? But I think yeah, the no um, pun intended. I think this is a. I wrote a, a piece this morning for a newspaper in Australia where I made the point that it's very interesting to compare the global, coordinated, relatively collaborative response to the 2008 financial crisis to the pretty scattered and sort of finger pointing, blame shifting response that we're seeing now. And I do think that part of the reason for that is this sort of loss of confidence in elites and experts and the conventional wisdom and leadership, you know, generally that we've seen globally in that time, you know? I mean, it's really interesting you say that. I was thinking the exact same thing these days. I was thinking that one of the main differences between the 2008 crisis 
putting aside the nature of the crisis, the fact that that was a credit crisis, this one is happening in an environment where there's far less credibility in governments and also much more dysfunction in the global, not just the global security environment, but also in terms of relations between countries, mm, both, yeah. both globally and within the West itself. And I think that does make it more unnerving because whether it was true or not that governments could do anything effective in the last crisis, people draw comfort in the idea that the Fed expanding its balance sheet, the government enacting fiscal stimulus, the you know tax cuts, whatever, that that's going to fix it. And it's also interesting that the solution to everything that has been offered for years in this country at least, and I think it's also true in certain other places for sure in the West, is that money is the solution to everything. Yeah. And that's what we see here with the Fed. You know, with this multi-trillion dollar package as if this is the solution, right? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of wacky. Yeah. I mean, this it's interesting here because this particular challenge poses a dilemma, right? I mean, you can let it burn from a health standpoint and, you know, who knows how many million people will probably die, but the global economy will continue to roll. Or you can shut down economic activity in order to preserve life. And for the vast majority of people... They won't experience anything significant from a health standpoint, but they might lose their jobs, right? I mean, I was supposed to speak next week at South by Southwest, which has been obviously canceled. That's not a big deal for me. It's a gigantic deal for the city of Austin and the, you know, whatever it is, 100,000 jobs that are tied to the festival. So there's this kind of dilemma, right? But are you going to prioritize the financial and economic impact or are you going to prioritize the health impact? A hundred percent. And also there's another problem, right? Which is that we don't have, we're not China, you know? And, right. and so if we shut down the economies, it's one thing for a multinational corporation. It has credit lines. It has a cash balance. It has the capacity, let's say, to pay salaries over a period of time. But a small business, no way. Yeah. A small right. business doesn't have the capacity to do that. So what happens, how are people supposed to feed themselves? So I mean- what I foresee in this situation, the way things are going, is that we're going to come out, I'm afraid that in an understandable, and I'm not debating whether this should be done or not, I think that we need to take the measures we need to take. I'm concerned about what the country looks like when we wake up on the other side of this. Yeah. And to some extent, that depends on how far away that other side is. And just as one data point, I don't know if you saw this, but the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson this morning said that they anticipate that infection cases in the UK will keep rising until about the middle of June, second or third week of June, and then start to come down. And a friend of mine who I, I trust who works for the National Health Service in the UK and is part of the coronavirus response told me last week that they think it's going to go for six to nine months. So there's a significant difference, right, between a acute crisis that's over by the end of April and a sustained crisis that keeps rolling until, you know, I mean, six to nine months from now is basically end of the year. So I think that's, you know, people have to sort of get their heads around this stuff early. And, you know, I think there's a sense that some people might have now that someone's overreacting, you know, but of course the way these virus things work, you have to seem that you're overreacting early, otherwise you'll be playing catch up. You know, if, if there's a 14-day incubation period and we're testing people on the basis of who has symptoms now, then we actually don't know where the virus is now. We know where it was 14 days ago, right? So yeah, which is super by scary. Definition, yeah, by definition, we're playing catch up. And unless you want to go pretty hard early, you are going to continue to play catch up. It's funny, you mentioned about the difference between China and Western countries. And, you know, Thomas Friedman has this thing about, I wish we could be China for a day. And I've been thinking about that, watching the Chinese response, right? Because the question in my mind is, okay, but which day of the crisis would you want to be China? Would you want to be China right at the beginning when they arrested and forced to apologize the doctor who first called attention to the, the virus in Wuhan? Or would you want to be them you know, a couple of months later when they built an entire hospital in, in a week? Like, you know, yeah. yes, they can respond in an incredibly draconian manner, drawing all the resources of the state together when they need to, 
but they also can have these deadly Chernobyl-like inabilities to respond because they can't be honest with themselves about what's going on. How do you think we're going to manage this? As someone who's spent a good part of his life in war zones, looking at countries and governments in all sorts of stressful situations. Well, I think there are a lot of resiliencies in the US population in particular that are going to stand us in good stead. I do think we tend to rally around and help each other when things go wrong. I also think that you know, there are some special features to this virus that might make it a, a source of cohesion, right? I mean, you know, in my very early 50s, I don't have any symptoms of the coronavirus. Even if I do get sick, it's extraordinarily unlikely that you know, it'll be fatal or even particularly severe. But I have people I love who are in my 80s. You know, I just canceled an event for this coming weekend with former Senator Gary Hart, not because I think I'm in any risk or any young people are, but because we don't want to transmit you know, the virus to old people. And, you know, you might not be personally at risk, but you know lots of people that would be. And I think this is about rallying around and saying, you know, we need to all do our part in order to protect people we love. And frankly, in the US scenario, if the government tried to go door to door, welding people into their apartments like the Chinese did, small matter of the second amendment, you would have a significant problem, right? But instead of doing that, if the government were to just ask people, hey, you know, <laughs> think carefully before you do your normal daily activities and think about others, I think that's actually more likely to succeed in the US or say in Australia or the UK than some other cultures. So I think we have some resiliencies, but, you know, unfortunately, I'm not seeing a lot of strong, let's say, clear communication from the top right now. So it's kind of hard to know how it's going to play out. Major, major problem in terms of leadership. In fact, I think I, I would love to get your take on the importance of that given your experience. But to your point about welding people in their homes, I think it seems to me from what I understand about this virus, because of its how contagious it is, and because we're in a place of mitigation, the goal here is not to prevent it from spreading. It's to delay the spread so that we can the infections can happen in a way where the hospital system can manage that. So, you know, I don't know what the right, I mean, the idea in China, China could be a complete mess right now, because like you said, they, they went from one extreme to now they're letting people back in the factories. What are they going to be dealing with mm -hmm. in the next few weeks or in a month? You yeah. Know? One of the questions that a lot of health professionals I talk to are worried about is whether we will get a sort of second wave here in the late part of the year, as happened with the 1918 influenza, yeah. where it came back much more dangerously and different towards the end of the year after a, a sort of spring first wave. And I think if we get reinfection in China, that'll be a whole different story, right? But, you know, just to sort of loosely link this to the book, right? I mean, I think a lot of people are blaming lack of preparation and lack of leadership on President Trump. And, you know, there's obviously some truth to that, absolutely. But I think it's worth pointing out that President Trump being elected in the first place is a symptom of people losing confidence in the conventional wisdom and in elites and in authority figures and in experts. And he, like other populist leaders who've been elected in the last few years in Western countries, I think in part, he's a symptom of a deeper issue. And one of the key elements in that sort of loss of civilizational confidence that we've seen in the last 20 years is that we've had an extended series of protracted wars where we keep being told we've got the best military in the world, and yet somehow we can't deliver success. And people have lost relatives and friends or you know, lost limbs to the war. They don't see any end, end in sight. And our sort of failure to deliver on that extraordinarily important issue while simultaneously telling people, hey, you know, don't we have the most awesome military in the world? Over time, you know, people start to think these idiots don't know what they're talking about. And I think what we're seeing with the coronavirus is a, an aspect of a broader, let's call it an elite collapse or a failure of confidence in the systems, you know, and institutions that it's really difficult to separate that from 20 years of inconclusive and largely failed military activity. Hmm. 
That's insightful. I, you know, I agree. And I think it's true both in terms of the solutions that we've attempted to solve political problems or socioeconomic problems through military means. And I think we've done the same thing with money. Mm -hmm. uh, we've made big promises. Our leaders and uh, policymakers have promised, I mean, you're bringing up the Iraq war by mentioning 20 years. The promise there was that we would be in and out. Yeah. The promise there was that it was going to be easy. This might be a good time for you to give our audience a sense of who you are, your background, your service in the military, and uh, your time as an advisor, both to Petraeus, to Condoleezza Rice. I mean, you're, you have a very distinguished career, so maybe you could give us your background right now. Yeah, well, I don't know if it's distinguished exactly. I think I was sort of in the wrong place at the wrong time quite a few times. But so, yeah, I, I'm Australian originally, as you can tell from the accent. I'm a professor at a university in Australia, the University of New South Wales in Canberra. It's one of the big, they call them the group of eight, the sort of big eight state universities in Australia. I had about 25 years in the Australian regular military, uh, went through the Australian Military Academy was an infantry officer, served all over Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And in the 1990s, I started doing my PhD on Islamic extremism and its relationship with terrorism. And the army at the time sort of said, why, why are you doing this again? You know, uh, it didn't seem particularly important in the 1990s. And I went through a lot of field work and eventually did my my PhD in a discipline called political anthropology, which is a little different from cultural anthropology, but looking at the impact on local level populations of guerrilla warfare and terrorism. And I finished my dissertation about eight weeks before 9-11. <laughs> so first uh, example of wrong place, wrong time. And I'd been sort of working my way up the army chain of command and was going to command a, you know, a regiment and so on. And at that point, people said, hey, look, this 9-11 thing's happened. We don't have a clear idea where a lot of these guys are coming from. Does anybody know anything about it? And the army said, oh, we have a guy. <laughs> so I ended up working for the Australian civilian government and then for the US government, helping people to get a grip of what was going on in the broader war on terrorism. And I had been an opponent of invading Iraq in the period up to 2003. I thought it was an extraordinarily bad idea for a variety of reasons, which frankly, if I was the military, I wouldn't have believed my argument. You know, I was a counterinsurgency expert. I'd spent 20 years looking at guerrilla warfare and my critique of Iraq was, you guys are going to start an insurgency and it's going to spiral out of control. And everybody said, well, of course you think that you're a, you're a counterinsurgency guy. <laughs> Right, which is that's a fair enough criticism. Once the war started and it did in fact spiral out of control, I got pulled in to the Pentagon to help figure out how to deal with that. I ended up working for a guy called Dave Petraeus, the at the time running the training element of the army. We wrote as part of our broader writing team the counterinsurgency manual. And then he got the gig as commander in Iraq at the beginning of the the surge in 2007 asked me to come along as his senior advisor for counterinsurgency. And I should say, I never, Petraeus didn't need my advice, right? I, I wasn't advising him. I was advising the units that were already in Iraq and all of their Iraqi counterparts on how to deal with the insurgency and how to apply the new constructs that General Petraeus had come up with. It was an extraordinarily successful few months in Iraq. Of course, that success didn't last. We got about a 96% reduction in violence in about a six-month period. I was called back to Washington and Secretary Condoleezza Rice, who was my boss, I was working for the State Department at the time, asked me to try to do something similar in Afghanistan. And I ended up working for another general called Stanley McChrystal, focused on basically trying to apply some of the same ideas from Iraq to Afghanistan. And it was pretty clear to me right from the outset that it wasn't going to work for a variety of reasons that we can get into if you want, but primarily because Afghanistan is just a very different society from Iraq. And, you know, principles translate from one campaign to another. 
but techniques very rarely do. And this is one case where we tried the template ideas from Iraq to Afghanistan and it just didn't transfer particularly well. Anyway, so I got out of the government in 2009. I started my own research company in 2010. And for the last 10 years or so, I've been working in a whole variety of war zones and conflict affected areas doing a number of different things, researching violence against civilians, figuring out ways to limit that, advising private companies and governments on particular crisis issues that they're dealing with, do a fair bit of work with NGOs. And because of my sort of particular set of skills to channel uh, Liam Neeson, I often get asked by humanitarian NGOs to, to talk with armed groups and so on. So I've had a sort of a worm's eye view of a lot of the the stuff that's gone on since 9-11. And I've written a number of books trying to bring that worm's eye perspective together with what we know from the the broader theoretical perspective on how this stuff works. So a lot to discuss there. First of all, I want listeners to know how much I really enjoyed your book. I think it's interesting because we recently did an, an episode with Peter Zihan from the exact same studio, actually. He was in Colorado. And that was a kind of geo political, theoretical, conceptual conversation. And his book was very educational for me. This Mm. one was also extremely educational. I've never read military theory. I mean, maybe peripherally, but you also have such an eclectic interdisciplinary approach. I mean, you use evolutionary biology and memetics and even theory of mind comes in when you're talking about liminal approaches to warfare and or no, sorry, conceptual when you're expanding the the concept space. I actually can't remember yeah. the name of it off the top of my head. Yeah, reflexive control. It's Soviet idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating. It's such an informative book. And I highly recommend it to everyone. Before I ask you the question that has come to mind, I, I just want to mention when you talk about how you were against the Iraq war, you know, there were a lot of people that were making similar very intelligent, coherent arguments. I was the beneficiary of one of those people. He was my professor of US foreign relations in junior year, the year that we invaded. Mm. And I was studying Mm. abroad in that semester and I was in Madrid. I remember exactly where Mm -hmm. I was. Madrid glued to CNN at a friend's apartment during the decapitation strike that Mm -hmm. you talk about in the book. You talk about it basically as being a straight, a line from the highway of death in 1991 Mm -hmm. to the Dora Farms decapitation strike. I'd love to ask you, I mean, I guess there are two questions that come to mind. One is, where does this book that you've written, Dragons and Snakes, and this will give you a chance to tell our listeners what those two words mean, what they're metaphors for, where you got it from, how does this book fit in the evolution of your previous books like The Accidental Guerrilla, Counterinsurgency, Out of the Mountains, and Blood Year? And also, how does Dora Farms fit into your larger conception of what went wrong and where we are in this world that we live in today? Yeah, so this is a long answer, so feel free to, you know, interrupt me <laughs> as I go. But, you know, I think to to talk about the the dragons versus the snakes for a minute. The title comes from James Woolsey, who was President Clinton's CIA director. And in the US government, the way that it works is if you get appointed to a position by a president, you have to be confirmed by the Senate. And so Woolsey was doing his Senate confirmation hearing in February of 1993. So about over 15 months since the collapse of communism and the end of the Cold War. And a member of the intelligence committee said to him, look, you know, we've defeated the Soviet Union. It's the end of the Cold War. What do you think the threat environment is going to be like in the 1990s? And Woolsey said, we've slain a large dragon, talking about the Soviet Union. But now we find ourselves in a jungle filled with a bewildering variety of poisonous snakes. And in many ways, the dragon was easier to keep track of. And he goes on to give an extraordinarily prescient description of the environment as it went on to exist in the 1990s. And your listeners can find that online. It's on the Intelligence Committee website. And it's incredibly insightful where he talks about essentially weak states, failing states, 
and non-state actors as being the main threat in the 1990s. And that's the category that I call snakes, right? Wolsey's snakes. The dragon or the dragons in this case are the state peer or near peer adversaries like Russia and China that we had been dealing with during the Cold War. And my argument in the book is that the dragons are back, right? After 20 years of focusing on non-state actors, you know, from 1993 until 2003, we did peacekeeping and counterinsurgency, and we dealt with some counterterrorism and counter narcotics issues. And that was the environment that I came up in as a young, you know, combat arms officer. After 2003, we narrowed our focus to just one snake, international extremist groups, and in particular, Islamic terrorism. And we became so sort of tunnel visioned on that one set of threats that everybody else started to adapt around us. Not only did the dragons watch and learn from how we struggled in Iraq and Afghanistan and come up with ways to fight us that avoided our strength, but also the snakes drew on this massive expansion in electronic connectivity and smartphones and GPS to build kind of a set of precision capabilities, which gave them a level of lethality that you used to have to be a nation state to attain. So we've got now dragons that fight a bit like snakes. We've got snakes that have the capacity to act like dragons. We're dealing with both snakes and dragons at the same time and in many of the same places. And our military model, which we pioneered during the Gulf War in 1991, is just not working anymore against these groups. And I think that's part of the reason why the modern Western world, which we sort of like to imagine is self-sustaining, but is actually supported by a particular military model, why it's starting to come apart at the seams, because the military underpinnings of our modern way of life are just not functioning anymore. Let me pause there in case you want to interject, but we can talk about you know the, the Dora farm strike too, if you want. Well, maybe the best next question to really ask you, because I do want to get into who the dragons are, who the snakes are, and how they learned, what they learned, and how they've evolved, and really couch that in some of these theories of coevolution and some of the other things you put forward, adaptive learning in the battlefield versus conceptual. But what is the Western approach to war? So this gets us to the Dora Farms, and I, I do draw a line between 1991 and the Highway of Death, which people of a certain age will remember was a series of airstrikes that destroyed an extraordinarily large number of Iraqi armored and soft skin vehicles that were trying to pull out of Kuwait at the end of the Gulf War and literally incinerated an unknown number of Iraqi military and civilians as part of the sort of culminating destruction of the Iraqi military. And the 1991 Gulf War basically showed everybody how not to fight the United States. The Chinese in particular drew some really stark lessons from that campaign. And it was basically, if you go out against the US in the open, in daylight, arrayed in a conventional fashion, and you try to defeat the United States on the battlefield, the outcome is going to be some variation of the highway of death. And told ourselves a very comforting story in the 1990s. We said that Western powers now are so dominant in warfare that it makes war a meaningless choice for any adversary. And therefore, we're going to create peace by you know, superior firepower, better precision weapons, better surveillance systems, this kind of high tech version of warfare, where we were essentially throwing money at the problem and high tech and saying that that was going to solve the issue. And two Chinese officers who I quote in the book described the American way of war that emerged from 1991 as shooting birds with golden bullets, right? And mentioned that, you know, stealth bombers were literally worth their weight in gold mm. and that only the United States would come up with such a ridiculously expensive way of waging war in order to avoid casualties. The 2003 Dora Farm strike is the bookend to that period. And that's the period in which it suddenly became obvious to everybody that, oh, you actually can 
fight the United States successfully, and you do it in a totally different way. Let me talk about the Dora Farms strike itself really quickly, but then talk about that other way of war. Immediately prior to the start of the war, on the night of the 18th to 19th of March 2003, President George W. Bush and George Tenet, who was the CIA director at the time, and others became aware through a signals intelligence intercept that Saddam and his two sons, Uday and Kuse, were going to be in a bunker at an area called the Dora Farms Complex just outside Baghdad. And they made the decision to assassinate or to target and kill those three individuals through an incredibly sophisticated precision strike. And it was, frankly, it was a tactical masterpiece, right? The US Air Force pulled the strike together at no notice in about an eight hour period. They put two stealth aircraft over Baghdad in literally the first minute of the war. The first thing the world or the Iraqis knew about it was when four gigantic guided bombs lit up the the compound and simultaneously a whole series of Tomahawk missiles and other missiles that had been fired by other US assets hit that compound. It was technical precision, but it was technology in the service of, frankly, a, a bit of a bankrupt strategic concept and a form of intelligence that was not really workable anymore. It turned out that the bunker where we thought Saddam was didn't exist. It had never existed. Saddam hadn't even been to that compound since 1995, and he wasn't there, and neither were his sons. And the strike destroyed its target, killed a number of civilians and wounded others, according to a study by the International Red Cross. But it wasn't until a few weeks later when US ground troops made it to the compound that they realized that the signals intelligence intercept was faulty, the intelligence was wrong, and the strike sort of hit nothing. More importantly, it illustrates a point which the Chinese theorists and also Russians had pointed out, which is that, to paraphrase, you know, the US with its very advanced form of warfare could effectively put a bomb through whatever window it chooses to do. But it can't really decide what's behind the window without knowing something about the society and having a, a strategy to to respond to that. And we just didn't have that in Iraq. We were acting as if Saddam was kind of the wicked witch of the East in The Wizard of Oz. And as soon as we killed him, the Iraqis would dance around like munchkins and welcome the Western invasion force. And of course, that's absolutely not what happened. We found an extraordinarily well-organized insurgency and guerrilla warfare campaign that had been planned for at least a decade by the Iraqis that they seamlessly rolled into the moment we captured major cities. We completely misread how the Iraqis planned to fight the war. They themselves misread it too, of course. They thought it was going to be an insurgency led by Saddam from hiding. He was quickly captured. But then Iraqi society turned into you know, 165 different guerrilla groups all fighting us in this amorphous cell-based fashion. And our much vaunted military model that had been sort of dominant since 1991 turned out to be actually pretty easy to defeat if you adopted different approaches. So what's interesting is that during that period, all of America's resources were devoted towards the Middle East. The focus was the Middle East. And the psyche of the body politic was also focused on that part of the world, Iraq, Afghanistan, terrorism, Al-Qaeda. It was what people were most terrified about. I do want to ask you how that threat evolved and the emergence of ISIS, because you talk about it at length in the book, and it's worth discussing. It hasn't gone away. I think particularly given some of the recent, I think it's even more relevant given some of the recent turmoil on the Turkish-Syrian border, as well mm -hmm. as maybe yeah. what's going on now with Saudi Arabia and Iran, and Iran's mm -hmm. recent strike last night of an Iraqi base that killed two Americans reportedly, I think, and one Brit. Yeah. But I want to maybe ask you first, while this was happening, while America was focused on Iraq, the insurgency in Iraq and maintaining order in Afghanistan, what were the dragons, the Chinas and the Russias of the world? What lessons were they drawing from what was happening to America and its Western allies 
and partners in the region? And how did they implement those changes and towards what end? Yeah, so huge question. So one of the theorists who I draw on in the book is Steve Rosen, who is one of the leading theorists of military adaptation and innovation. And Steve makes the point that there are actually two modes in which people adapt. One is a sort of peacetime mode, where what you're doing is you're scanning the environment, you're seeing what's going on in the conflict space, you are drawing conclusions and coming up with concepts for how to adapt and improve, and then you're applying those in a relatively top-down sort of conscious manner, kind of a conscious adaptation to the environment mode. The other mode is a wartime mode, where you get into a basically a co-evolutionary tit-for-tat adaptation where your adversary does something on the battlefield, so you respond, so they respond to you, so you respond to them, so they respond to you, and you get into this back and forth. I call it an adaptive two-part dance in one part of the book. And we, in that period, were in wartime mode. We were responding to the threat on the ground. The threat was responding to us. We were adapting it back. And one of the side effects of that form of adaptation is that you you see a lot of co-evolution in which you know, we come to resemble our adversary in many ways. Meanwhile, Russia and China, but also Iran to some extent and North Korea were watching a struggle, but they weren't caught up in the day-to-day wartime evolution mode. They weren't engaged in the conflicts that we were in. And so they were able to watch and learn from our mistakes. And we started to see active efforts to copy and to build capabilities that would counteract Western dominance. So in the Chinese case, we've seen three different strands of development. One focusing on maritime and naval development. You know, your listeners may be aware that China until really about five years ago had been primarily a land-based power since roughly the middle of the 15th century. The Chinese Communist Party's fought a number of wars. They were all land-based. They've had a number of small naval skirmishes over the past 70 years of the Communist Party, but really, you know, China has not had a ocean-going navy capable of projecting power globally since really the middle of the 15th century. So it's a massive transformation to the global strategic environment to now have China with aircraft carriers, an entire fleet of submarines, a new class of ballistic missiles that can knock out an American aircraft carrier at a distance of about 2,500 miles, building a sort of militarized archipelago of islands in the South China Sea. So this is one strand of development. Another was nuclear, so building nuclear-capable submarines, expanding and improving the nuclear arsenal. And the third was what the Chinese originally called unrestricted warfare and later adopted formally as something called the Three Warfares Doctrine, which focused on information warfare, they call it public opinion warfare, cyber, and on lawfare, what they call legal warfare, so manipulating legal norms. And what I argue in the book is that they engaged in something that I call conceptual envelopment. So realizing that the US was dominant and Western allies aligned with the US were dominant in a very narrowly defined particular form of conventional force on force warfare, the kind of stuff we've just been talking about. And that if they could get outside the space that we considered to be war, then A, we would struggle to recognize what they were doing as warlike. And B, they'd be free to expand and develop without running into a major competition with the US. And I suggest in the book that two really bad things can result when your adversary has a much, much broader definition of warfare than you do. One, you can be engaging in things that you consider to be normal peacetime interaction, but your adversary is running what they consider to be a warlike campaign against you. And before you know it, you're in a conflict without even realizing it. The other thing, which is even worse, is that you can be engaging in things that seem normal and competitive to you, for example, trade wars or tariffs, both of which actually fit in the Chinese warfighting doctrine, and your adversary can be interpreting those as acts of war. So you can fighting people that you have no intention of fighting, more or less through through accident. I think the Russians were a little more reactive in their learning. They went through a series of conflicts internally in Chechnya and Dagestan and elsewhere in the 1990s. They hit rock bottom 
in the late 1990s at the end of the Yeltsin government with all kinds of internal problems and really their military had been in free fall through most of the 1990s, even though military officers had engaged in a lot of learning and adaptation to improve their performance in places like Chechnya. But as a whole, the country was extraordinarily weakened after the 1990s. Under President Putin since then, we've seen this initially gradual, but then rapidly accelerating recovery of military capability. And under the new look reforms that were introduced in 2011, we've seen Russia really become, again, a very major global military player, and most notably by the invasion of Crimea and the barely covert intervention in Ukraine, but also through its essentially rescuing the regime of Bashar al-Assad in Syria and establishing itself again as a major player in the Middle East and in North Africa. So while we've been engaged in this wartime adaptation mode, kind of tunnel vision on terrorism, our adversaries have been free enough to, or I should say our state adversaries, the dragons, have been free enough to look at us, learn from our struggles, figure out how to adapt, and then apply this very conscious form of adaptation as ways of avoiding our our strength. So let's really dig in here. First of all, I want to just point this out for listeners because there are hints of it when you speak about this. This is very much the way that you describe the evolution of military environments and relations between countries and threats is very much in a sort of ecological, biological sense, evolutionary biology. And there's a co-evolutionary type process. And uh, from what I've been able to understand, when you talk about this conceptual innovation versus wartime adaptation, no country, as I understand it, evolves only conceptually or only in wartime environments. There's a constant ebb and flow depending on who is sort of backtracking and who is on the offensive at any moment in time. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And I identify four different mechanisms of uh, military adaptation, which we can talk about, but for sure, it's always a mix. So yeah, I'm happy to talk about those. Let's drill in to each of these two countries because another thing that's also helpful is that you lay out these two different methodologies. One of them is theory of liminal warfare or liminal maneuver space for how Russia has adapted and evolved. And we already talked about conceptual envelopment for China. You lay these out in a very geospatial way. One, the liminal maneuver space is vertical escalation, whereas conceptual envelopment is horizontal in its form in the sense that it expands the scope of the battlefield to include things that most Americans traditionally wouldn't even consider to be within the theater of war, like Mm. financial markets or financial assets or drug supply chains, et cetera. Maybe you can tell us where have Western strategists like yourself come up with theories about how the Chinese view or think about war and how important is Unrestricted Warfare, the book published by those two PLA senior colonels in February of 1999. How important was that in informing your views and the views of your compatriots? So very important. Let me just give a caveat though real quickly. I've been thinking about biological metaphors and analogies for and using biological systems theory to think about adversaries for about 15 to 20 years. I wrote my first paper on this question back in 2002. I've always been extraordinarily reluctant to put this discussion out there into the public space because one of the things we see in genocide and guerrilla warfare and terrorism is a sort of dehumanizing of adversaries, talking about them as, you know, microbes and cockroaches and bacilli. And there's this sort of dehumanizing effect that people sometimes apply to an adversary as a precursor for you know extraordinarily violent genocidal activity and i can give you examples of that but i'm sure people are familiar so i've always been very reluctant to do it and the reason i've done it now is for two reasons one because the point i'm making is not that the enemy is like a microbe and we are 
clean in our lab coats, you know, peering into the Petri dish from outside. I'm making the point that we're all like that. We're all experiencing the same sort of combat Darwinism, the same adaptive pressure. And I'm trying to say that the adversary is the same as us, right? He's a human like us. He's adapting in environments very similar to what we're adapting in, except that in his case, he's adapting in an environment that we created in 1991, what evolutionary theorists would call a fitness landscape that punishes- We've had a hand in shaping that fitness landscape. Yeah. In fact, we dominate it. Where Another analogy would be to say, we're the apex predator in the, in the ecosystem. Everybody's adapting to us. But a fitness landscape is basically a way of thinking about different combinations of traits and an environment will punish certain behaviors and characteristics and reward others. And the dominant military player in a military version of a fitness landscape kind of sets the conditions that that reward and punish certain kinds of behavior. And in so doing, whether consciously or unconsciously, shapes the adaptation and evolution of everybody else. And my argument is that one reason why we're seeing all these very different adversaries come up with rather similar ways of operating is because they're all reacting to the same set of adaptive pressures, which we created after 1991. So I just want to caveat that by saying, I'm, I'm not trying to say, you know, the enemy's a microbe. I'm trying to say, we're all in the same boat. We're all in a, a combat ecosystem together. And I should say some of these ideas are controversial in evolutionary theory, ideas about group selection in particular. I haven't yet decided whether this is just an analogy or whether it's kind of a computationally valid observation of what's going on. There are theorists out there like Dominic Johnson at Oxford who do think of it, and he's a population biologist by background, who think about this stuff as a real, true, you know, computationally valid observation of warfare. There are others who tend to think of it primarily as a metaphor. I'm sure I'm not qualified actually in the scientific literature to make that call, but I'm using a lot of ideas that others have also put forward to try to make sense of the adaptive behavior that we're seeing. Well, it seems having read your book, I actually on the side of a particular page when you were discussing this, and I have quotes from Dominic Johnson in the rundown for listeners who are subscribers to the rundowns. I actually scribbled Goldilocks because hmm. to me, it felt very much like the optimal environment for an adversary is one where it's not too hot, not too cold. It's not so easy that there's no stress. You know, there's another great book by or concept by Nassim Taleb, Anti Fragile. Yeah. I'm sure you're familiar with it, mm -hmm. but it, it's not an environment where there isn't enough stress so that you're not adapting, you're not changing, you're not evolving, you're not improving, but it's not so overwhelming that it causes extinction, that it kills off the adversary entirely. And it seems that the worst thing that you can do is engage an adversary in a competitively difficult environment in which that adversary can survive. That seems to be sort yeah. of the worst of all outcomes. And that's a mechanism that we call artificial or unconscious artificial selection following Charles Darwin. And you could summarize it by saying- Is that, that also we, combat Darwinism? I think you yeah, sort of. Too. I think that's a broader term that people just use to describe the both the natural selection and artificial selection effect. So natural selection is what we've actually been talking about, right? It's where just certain features in the environment reward or punish certain behaviors. And so over time, certain behaviors come to dominate in a in a population of combat actors, and that's natural selection at work. Artificial selection is basically where we have put just enough pressure on certain adversaries to make them better through adaptation, but not enough to destroy them. So we have actually bred a better class of terrorists over the last 20 years. And I use an example from Pakistan and one from Israel to show how if you put enough pressure on an adversary to make him better, but not enough to destroy them, you actually end up with more of them and also a better class of adversary. But you talked about the low end of the pressure spectrum where you start to stagnate. I would argue that we are actually, as the dominant players since 1991, that's the danger for us, that we've been at the bottom end of the spectrum where no adversary has put enough pressure on us to force us to get better. And as a consequence, we've, to some extent, stagnated. You know, Ross Douthat, the New York Times columnist, has a book out now about decadence, and I've only read mm. part of it. I'd love to have a conversation with him about that because he's not coming from the same place as I am, but I'm reading his book through the lens of this idea of stagnation. And in part, I think you can say that 
we're suffering from what you might call a victory disease, right? We've been the top dog for so long in a in a conventional sense that we haven't had the kinds of pressures that others have had to adapt, and as a consequence, our model has stagnated. Hmm. A disease of affluence. I mean, yeah, exactly. Term, that's a term from diet and yeah. You could argue biology. this is a this is a military version of obesity and diabetes that we've seen hmm. skyrocket in you know affluent Western societies for sure. So let's go back to this point about conceptual involvement because yeah, I want to yeah. I want to really tie a neat bow around our discussion around China and then I think we can begin to discuss Russia and some of the other players and as well as what you think the the best way forward for the United States is maybe in the overtime. So yeah. I find this idea of conceptual envelopment or horizontal escalation to be not only fascinating, but it resonates. We did a number of episodes on China, but there's one that really sticks out. And it was a conversation with a hedge fund manager by the name of Kyle Bass. He's based out of Texas. And he is a member of a group. I can't remember the name now, but it basically it deals with China and they've been ringing the alarm bell to basically say that, and he's been very explicit about this, that China has been at war with us for the better part of 20 years and that their conception of war, their definition of war is different than ours and that when they buy a hotel near a naval base, mm -hmm. as you talk about in the book, mm -hmm. or when they distribute drugs or opioids in the United States, that they don't see that simply as a commercial operation, that there is more behind that and that it's fair to assume that additionally also because of the centralization of the Chinese political system, the centralization of the party, the government structure, and then the corporations. Help me understand and for our listeners, how well established is this? And what does it mean in practical terms? Where can we see examples of this strategy being, having been or currently being implemented? Yeah. So I should say that conceptual envelopment is my term. There are a number of other terms that are used. Unrestricted warfare is one. Three warfares is the official Chinese doctrinal term. But there are other people who, who describe it in, in different ways. Let's go back to the two guys who wrote the book Unrestricted Warfare. So as you mentioned, in February 1999, two Chinese senior colonels, Chao Liang and Wang Shengsui, wrote a book which was explicitly about this question of 1991 and US military dominance and how should the China adapt to that. And they make a number of critiques of how the US operates. They talk about weaknesses, but also strengths in the US system. And they make the point that the way to deal with this is to go to what they call warfare beyond rules, to say, we're going to expand the definition of war to the point where the battlefield is everywhere and warfare is everything. And in so doing, we're going to get outside that narrowly defined space, which the US calls warfare, but is actually bounded by a set of rules that the US made up. So if we can move outside the US conceptual framing of what warfare is, we can find space to maneuver. Now, they don't suggest that China should give up on conventional military capability development. And in fact, China hasn't. China's done a lot in improving those capabilities. But they do suggest a whole range of other ways to think about conflict. And I've listed some of them in the book. In fact, I've reproduced a diagram from their, their book in translation showing how they conceive of a much broader range of things. Strategic real estate acquisitions, acquiring control over key technologies, financial warfare, manipulation of markets, information warfare. And remember, these guys wrote this book at the infancy of the internet, but they're talking about a whole series of sophisticated online political warfare strategies. And one of my key questions in reading this book, and I read it when it first came out, I happened to be at the Australian War College a year or so after it was issued in translation, and I read it when it was very new. One of my key questions at the time was, is this just two guys you know, running their mouths without any authorization? Or is this the official Chinese position? Or is it the view of one particular faction in a fragmented professional debate that's going on? 
in the People's Liberation Army. And at the time, we didn't really have much evidence for that, to answer that. So what I did in this book is I traced the subsequent careers of those two officers to see what happened to them. And I reasoned that, you know, if they ended up in the gulag or they got fired or they didn't progress in their careers, then probably it wasn't officially endorsed. But if they did well, then that might suggest that their ideas were pretty aligned with mainstream thinking. It turns out that both of them made uh, general rank. One of them ended up as a very senior researcher in the Chinese scientific R&D community and has been very influential in a lot of advanced technology projects that China has worked on. The other one ended up as the head of curriculum development at the main Chinese war college, responsible for shaping the strategic thinking of a whole generation of senior Chinese officers. So I think that kind of answers the question, right? They were not out of the mainstream. And the fact that the Three Warfares Doctrine was introduced a few years later, drawing very heavily on a lot of their ideas, suggests also that they were at least acceptable or you know, formed the basis for official Chinese thinking in the, in the years later. I don't know if I could, would go so far as to say that the Chinese have been engaged in warfare against us for 20 years. They have certainly treated us as what military innovators call it a pacing threat since about the middle of the 1990s. A, a pacing threat is basically picking a, a benchmark adversary and working to develop your capabilities to ensure you can defeat that adversary. And that's definitely how they've thought about us since at least about 1996. But I think when we look at this idea of conceptual envelopment, one of the ideas that I draw on is this idea of horizontal escalation. So this is an old idea in strategy. It actually comes from nuclear strategy. The idea is that you can do vertical escalation where you go up and down an escalatory ladder of intensity in one area or one category of competition or one war zone. So, you know, brinkmanship, you know, in the Cuban Missile Crisis would be an example of, of vertical escalation. Horizontal escalation is expanding the range of areas of competition or moving beyond the current geographical focus or getting into other areas of competition that an adversary may not be paying attention to. And this is a great example of horizontal escalation. And in particular, creating a whole set of categories of competition which lie outside our definition of warfare. And even if we could conceive these as war, the US military and the US Department of Defense doesn't really have the authorities to to deal with them. You mentioned hotel purchases. In the book, I talk about Chinese company that was later taken over by the government attempting to buy the Hotel Del Coronado in San Diego Bay in uh, 2016. And that is uh, at the heart of an incredibly dense collection of naval units, carrier battle groups, Fleet Intelligence Command Pacific is there, Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command is right there that controls all the US global satellite communication systems. And this Chinese company wanted to buy essentially a 300 foot tall radio listing post in the middle of that. They were blocked by a thing called CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US, which decided based on national security concerns to deny the the sale. When you look at Europe and Latin America and the UK and elsewhere, these places don't have an equivalent of CFIUS. And what I map out in the book is the extraordinary degree of penetration by Chinese companies of hotels, port operators, road systems, railways, hotel operating groups, container facilities all over Europe and Latin America and elsewhere, which gives them incredibly strong penetration into not only the the military systems of Western powers, but all their civilian, economic, and political systems as well. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? In some ways, it's a, a form of economic interdependence, which might actually make conflict less likely. But it's actually incredible, as I've been talking to people in Europe, how few people even think about this stuff in a strategic sense and how few people consider it to have any meaning other than purely commercial. Whereas, of course, you know, the Chinese, by their own doctrine, consider it to be part of a much broader warfighting strategy.
Where would you rank discussions around 5G and Huawei in Europe, specifically Germany, for example? Where would you rank that? And what would the adoption of Chinese 5G technology mean for the transatlantic alliance and the, I guess, the security of Western allies? So there are two elements here. There's the European group within NATO, so you know, the EU, and then there's the UK, which is part of something we call the Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Alliance, and the implications are different for both. So in the EU, there is, I think, a high likelihood that EU countries will allow pretty significant Chinese participation in 5G systems. And the US has been pretty unhappy about that. As I mentioned, one of the concepts in unrestricted warfare was gaining control of advanced technologies as a way of shaping the environment. And China has been working very hard to dominate the space for supply of the transmission systems and the wiring systems and all the ancillary hardware that has to be in place in order for a, a 5G system to work. And the EU has talked about protecting its data from being acquired by the Chinese. The US is not particularly convinced by the EU approach, but it's also putting the case that just letting China control the supply of all these critical components, even if they don't have access to your data, is effectively giving a, a chokehold over EU systems to, to China. In the case of the UK, it's quite different. The, UK has a bill on the parliament floor right now talking about limiting Chinese participation in their 5G systems to about 35% of component. And the US is extremely unhappy about that and has actually talked about excluding the UK from the Five Eyes intelligence sharing arrangement or limiting their access if the UK doesn't, in fact, exclude China from its systems. There's actually been a revolt by a number of parliamentarians on the floor in the House of Commons this last week attempting to block that bill because of concerns that they'll be excluded from intelligence sharing with the US if they go through with it. In Australia, which is another member of the Five Eyes arrangement, Australia has been extremely hard over on excluding Huawei, which is one of the leading purveyors of this 5G technology from China from critical systems for exactly that reason. So I think it's going to be an area of, again, this, you know, you wouldn't think that microtransmitters and silicon chips and, you know, copper wiring and fiber optic would be necessarily a, a zone of major military competition, but in fact they are. And that's just a reflection of this conceptual envelopment that we've seen over the past 10 to 15 years. And it is a great example of conceptual envelopment because one player here, or a couple of players, let's say Australia and the US, regard this as an aspect of military grade competition with China, whereas other players, people in the British Parliament and governments in the EU, don't see it as fitting into a military competition at all. So it's, it literally is a conceptual disagreement about whether this is or is not part of warfare. So what you're describing here is the likelihood that the a foreign adversary is engaged in military competition with us, with Western countries, without us knowing. But there's a flip side to this, which you also talk about in the book. And that flip side is that we may be perceiving, and this gets to my point about theory of mind early on, which is that we're we're making assessments. We're making subjective assessments of what our adversaries or Western adversaries are thinking or how they see us. And we take actions accordingly. And they do the same thing. And so the flip side of this is the risk that we may see them as engaging in a wartime action or in warlike behavior when in fact they're actually engaged in a kind of peacetime action. And the same thing goes for us. A great example, Huawei, the arrest of the CEO's daughter. I forget her position at the company up in yeah, Vice President. Canada. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, a great, that's a great example. The Chinese interpret it one way and the Americans may well interpret it in a different way. And this happens often. And in fact, this is kind of the classic problem of diplomacy. 
we saw this in the Soviet Union going back to the sources of Soviet conduct. There was a great amount of effort put into trying to understand the Soviet mind so that we could effectively negotiate with them and de-escalate. I want to ask you about that on the other side of this conversation. We're going to do the second hour, David, as overtime. This has been an amazing conversation so far. For regular listeners, you know the drill. If you're new to the program or if you haven't subscribed yet to our audio file, Autodidact or Super Nerd Tears, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces or scroll down to the bottom of the summary to this week's episode and click on the link that sends you to the Patreon page as well as the link that explains how you can integrate the overtime RSS feed into your podcast application of choice so you can listen to it just like you listen to the regular episode. David, stick around. We'll be right back. Sure. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded at Creative Media Design Studio in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.